part of growing up uh, at the Dunn House, um, we, we call it going to the country. Uh, we go to go to the country a lot. And I think it's, I'm so glad Mom and Dad are here uh, today. My mom and dad have been the biggest supporters of my life, uh, my heroes. Uh, they've been in like every key ball game to, to this day. I, I, I stand before you as a testimony of what uh, the impact of parents can have on a person's life. And um, I'm so thankful for that. I wish every child had had uh, the opportunity to go <coughs> home like I had. I got through it. I'm not saying this is perfect. Mother whipped me, heaven knows. I don't know any times. But spank me, excuse me, I don't to say that right. Many times. But uh, it was every time I deserved it. And uh, I'm just so thankful for such loving time. But we go to the country. So, uh, many of you grew up with the same experiences. The world has changed. Uh, if you're my age, uh, even, uh, you'll remember uh, you can go to the country and everybody had a garden. And so I grew up around gardening. Uh, my grandmother and my grandfather, my dad's parents, actually had two gardens, his and hers. <laughs> and hers was way better than his. His always ended up with weeds and grass and Things. And he would grow things such as watermelons and peanuts. And my grandmother, she was, uh, her garden was perfect. Hers was just, as my, in my memory of it, Dad, I don't know how you remember, but in my memory of it was, my grandmother's was just over the ditch in the backyard. And uh, I can remember being out there plowing and hoeing. And, uh, I remember my dad going out to her garden with a salt shaker and eating tomatoes. Um, uh, tomato vines and uh, just great, great uh, memories of that and, it, and it's a part of the DNA of my life. My, my dad and my mom and dad still have just a little a little garden every year and uh, they can just pretty much have tomatoes and a couple other things like that. But uh, when I started pastoring churches, uh, you know, when you, I first got started, I was out more in the country. Uh, little country churches, and uh, so I always had a garden. I remember Mr. James Turney at Gandy's Cove Church. Um, somebody had told me that, uh, that the garden spot was out beside the church, the parsonage was on the other side. And so I asked Mr. James Turney, I said, uh, Would you mind turning the garden for me? And he said, Oh, they call me Brother Barry. Oh, Brother Barry, I'll be glad to turn the garden for you. Now, keep in mind, Lydia and I had just met, we weren't married or you know, I was single, and uh, I, I left that with him, and next time I got up there to see that little garden spot that I wanted, it looked like he had found an acre. <laughs> you know, I don't know what he, his idea of a garden and my idea of a garden was way different. And, and then, you know, when somebody does something like that, Mr. Bergen, you feel a little bit obligated to plant, you know, you know what I mean? Boy, I had a busy, uh, a busy summer and fall. I, I planted a whole lot of corn. I'll just tell you that. You know I'm I had a whole lot of worms. In my but uh, you know, in, in gardening, I, I learned a, a lot. It, gardening is not an easy uh, thing, uh, and there, there are rewards that come with uh, your giving it the time and the care and the love and all the things that it that it needs in order for it to grow. And those images of gardens and growing and all those kind of things are not lost on the writers of Scripture either. In fact, uh, these ideas of growth and, um, and, and, and agriculture is, is just linked in, in the Word of God. And, and they are pictures that help us to understand ourselves uh, to understand uh, what it means for us to be in a relationship with the Lord uh, in terms of growth. And I want us to spend some time, if, if you can put our mission statement up there just for a minute, Andrew, um, I want to talk about it just for a second. This is the, 
This is the vision. I said mission statement. I meant vision. Pardon. This is the vision of our church. The Master's Way is committed to creating entry points, which become pathways leading to growing deeper, healing hearts, sharing lives, and serving the world, focusing on the families of West, West Mass. If you take that vision and you dissect it just a little bit, there are really three key components to that vision. Last week I talked about entry points and how important it is, it is for us to be making connections with those who are yet outside of the kingdom of God. Those who are yet outside of the life of the church. There are those who have a, maybe a relationship with the Lord. It, maybe it's not vital. It, uh, it may be personal, but it's not vital. It's not growing. It's not developing because they don't have a place to grow. And uh, we need to be providing opportunities for them to enter into the life of our church. And we call those here at the Master's Way entry points are places where we can touch a person's life corporately so that they can get connected to us uh, in ways that may lead to uh, a pathway to greater and deeper growth. And so an entry point would be something like our Mother's Day Out program where uh, a person uh, might just need care for their children and they may not be thinking about uh, life in the church at that moment, they're just thinking about wanting uh, Junior, our, our little darling, uh, to have a place to be loved. And uh, a place to be, uh, so mom can have a break, or mom and dad can have a break. But, it, but by providing a Mother's Day out program, it does give us an opportunity to touch a life and to develop a relationship possibly with someone who's outside the walls of our church or outside of a relationship with Christ and uh, give us an opportunity to develop a relationship with them that might become then or lead to an entryway that might lead to a path that leads to greater and deeper relationship with, with Christ and with us. So we have a mothers and preschool program. The moms who can come and, and have a lunch without having to try to feed two other children. And we provide ministry and mentoring and uh, advice and lessons and Karen is a mentor and I know it's a great blessing to you to be able to speak into a mom's life who's going through something you've already been and there's biblical wisdom in that that those of us who are who are older need to be speaking into the lives of those who are and those are all entry points things like egg hunts that we think to ourselves well I don't know what good that is. That just seems like, you know, you know, kid fun or whatever. Why don't we do that, Pastor Barry? Because there may be someone who will come to an egg hunt who might not come here on a Sunday morning. But they might bring their child to an egg hunt. And while they're at that egg hunt, they might meet you. And you might be a connection to them for being here. And by coming here, when they meet Christ, it makes all the difference. And so we talk about entry points, but this morning I wanted to uh, talk with you about pathways to grow. And we sometimes, uh, uh, we idealize or we get an idea of what it means for us to be a Christian, for us to be a follower of Jesus, and some of those ideas are good, and some of those ideas are not biblical at all. And uh, we need to challenge those ideas with the word of God's truth. So that we understand what does it mean for me to be on the path and uh, for me to be in this league to a place of growing. And obviously, uh, to get on the right path, I need to have a, a relationship that's vital and personal uh, with Christ. And there needs to be a place for me uh, to have uh, that where I can hear the word of truth and respond to Jesus who, is, uh, who has so loved the world. He's laid down his life. So, uh, that, that is the beginning place, but it's only a beginning place. It's the beginning place of a life. We sometimes think that as soon as we get a person to a place of prayer, to a place of saying, Lord, I invite you into my heart and my life, and uh, to be my Savior, to forgive me of my sins, uh, and to cleanse me from my Lord, I, I give you my heart and my life, and I'm baptized, then that's the end. And somehow, that being baptized as a believer is an end instead of a beginning. And that's just not so. 
That's just not a biblical understanding of, uh, of the Christian life. The faith that I live into, that I've chosen, when I've chosen Christ, is a, is a life. And, it, and, and, and I need to understand that it's a life. And it's daily. And it doesn't end until I'm gloriously in His presence one day. And that I have experienced what Jesus has already experienced in terms of resurrection. It's the hope of every believer is not in this world, but in the world to come. Do we know that? And that what's going on in this world is in a sense a dress rehearsal or just preparing me for when I'm really going to be alive in the presence of God. Now, that doesn't freak you out, does it? Does it freak you out to think about that you're going to be more alive when, you, when, when, uh, when we get into the presence of God than you are now? And that somehow that, that this life is preparing me for that one? And that's why and when I understand that and that's the faith I live into, it affects my the way I view my circumstances in my life. It affects how I look at myself daily. So I'm not like that fellow whose door I knocked on in Kentucky. And I said, I, I was visiting with him. I said, hey, do you, uh, do you know the Lord? Do you have a relationship with the Lord? He said, man, I was baptized 20 years ago. I wouldn't ask him if he was baptized 20 years ago. I was asking him if he was living in it now. You know, that, that we've been called to a life, to a pathway that leads to greater and deeper things and understandings. The people in Colossians are, uh, that are being written to in this letter to the Colossians, uh, they live in the, in the pathway uh, between two uh, great places from the east and the west, uh, a trade route, and it had once been a very strategic, during the, uh, the Roman Wars, the, the Persian Wars or whatever, it had once been a, uh, uh, a strategic kind of place that's set up in the mountains, kind of isolated from other places. It was known for its, uh, for its wool. And the people there, uh, they, they had sheep that had darker wool than other places. And so they were, they were kind of known for that. They were also known to be uh, mystic kind of folks, ascetic folks. And so they were, uh, their religions had taken them into uh, uh, you know, incantations and, and these feasts and, uh, and this, uh, getting into these transcendental states and all those kinds of things, uh, along with uh, uh, some Judaizers, some Jewish folks that were influenced them. And they had kind of a, uh, scholars believe they had a weird combination of the Jewish faith plus some mysticism that had kind of been, kind of been brought together. <coughs> Syn syncretic or syn syncretic or whatever, I can't even say the word. Uh, synchronizing them together. And it was uh, an odd thing. Paul and those missionaries come into that world with the gospel of Jesus. And they're thinking that, uh, hey, we've got to do certain things. And we've got to, there, there are certain places that we go and that's where God is. Certain things that we do, and that's how God is pleased. And Paul comes in there and tells him, Hey, you know what? God has reached out to you. He's come in the flesh in the person of Jesus. And that Jesus has taken your sins upon himself. He's died on the cross for the sins of the world. He's become the supreme sacrifice for the sins of the world. And God has highly exalted him and set him at his right hand and he sets an authority over all of creation and over the church. And he is the way to our kingdom's pathway. That was good news. Good news for them. They were trying to earn their way 
trying to, to get into a state of mind so they could so they could be more heavenly. We're honoring all these kinds of feasts, and dietary restrictions, and all these kinds of things. I was getting used to it. He told him, he said, you know, we're not we're not pleasing God by any of those things. We please God by entering into a relationship with Jesus through faith and his sacrifice. But that when we choose that life with Jesus, it causes us to be on a path that, that, is a, that is a life of conducting ourselves a certain way. And so for Christians, uh, there are certain choices that aren't really choices for us. Right? We've been called not only to Christ, but to a way of life. A way of conducting myself. And my faith compels me to live my life a certain way. I don't have the other choices. That's why these the, the deviant uh, lifestyles and choices that are set, set before us now in the, in the postmodern world where we're, we're all enlightened, well, they may all be enlightened, but we don't have those choices as followers of Jesus. They, you know, the gold standard for those who choose to follow Christ is fidelity in marriage and celibacy in singleness. Anybody want to say amen? There may be alternative lifestyles. There's not alternative Christian lifestyles. And there are those who, who may become who, who, uh, whom we love who are living in, in confusing times and maybe confusing sense and they, and they come here. And the, 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 the truth of the matter is that all of us come just as we are. We come with our brokenness. We come with our confusions. We come with our, our, you know, our ideas. And, and, and we need to grow. And all those kinds of things. The, the calling on all of our lives. Every, I, I would say this to you. Every person, regardless of where they've been or who they are, or what lifestyle they've chosen for themselves, are welcome to come through those doors and to sit in this place and to hear the word of God. They're welcome. But you know what none of us are welcome to do? Not a single one of us, not Pastor Barry either. None of us are welcome to stay the same Amen. if we're choosing to follow Jesus. That makes sense. Not me, not you, not any of us. Because when I make a choice to be to follow Christ and I'm saying, Lord, I'll live by your ways. But when I put my faith in Christ and Him alone, He's called me to conduct my life a certain way. And we sometimes get confused with these passages like we find in Colossians where it says, Walk in a manner <coughs> worthy. Walk worthy. The reason he, he's saying that is because there is a standard that he has called us to, but he's given us the resources to live into those standards. And that's what, what you know, this whole thing of pathways and, and getting to places of growing. We're going to spend the next four weeks talking about what we hope happens in the midst of life groups in terms of healing and growing and belonging and serving. But today, I just want to talk with you about growing. Andrew, would you put up that passage from Colossians for me? As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. You hear that? It doesn't say walk in some other way. It says, so walk in Him. Rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Leave that up there just for a second. And so you notice that the Scriptures call us to a life. And they call us to be rooted and built up in Him, in a person. We're not called, uh, our faith does not call us to a place. It doesn't call us to a mountain or to a temple. It calls us to a person. To a vital and personal relationship with Christ. 
And it says that we are to be rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith. As you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And so, He's suggesting to us that, that our life following Jesus is a prescribed life given to us and enabled by the Holy Spirit who's come to indwell us and to empower us to live this life. A way of conducting myself that is, that is honoring to God. And so I enter into that life through faith in His name. And then I'm called to walk out that life through the help of His Spirit. And through an understanding of His Word and truth that teaches me this way that is His way. And He's saying, be rooted and grounded. Be firm in it. But I, want to, I want to share with you uh, just a little bit of a story of how I came to be at the Master's Way. And, and why I think that God brought me this way. <coughs> when I entered into the ministry, God had given me a little bit of a, uh, of a gift uh, for evangelism. I don't know that I don't still walk in that. I think we should all love the gift of evangelism. And I, and I had a, um, for some reason, I'd get up and preach and people would come uh, down because I was I was calling them intentionally and I could get really animated about it and uh, sometimes we'd wait on folks to come down you know how <laughs> Billy Gray would come down and, and I would lead them in a sinner's prayer I would lead them in a prayer to receive Christ as Lord and Savior confessing their sins and entrusting themselves uh, into into Him in His life and I really didn't know what else to say to them after that. But the more, because I, I was very young myself in understanding things and things of God. And the more and more I got into Scripture, I began to realize that there was this dynamic that was going on. It was uh, that, that, my, that there was the, the faith aspect of it, my accepting Christ to be my Savior, but there was also the life aspect of it. This thing was calling me to a way of life and a way of living. And I could see that. And I realized that, that there was those two things, the life and my faith were dynamically related to each other. And the more I lived into my faith, the more the, 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 the life that I wanted to live, and the more I chose to live my life a certain way, the more my faith grew. My trust in Him. And so I realized that it wasn't faith or works or faith and life. It was faith life. It was a dynamic relationship. And I began to see how important it was for, uh, for us to enter into uh, a, a life that was ongoing and, and, and was growing, that was developing. And so these people who, who I had an opportunity to, to lead to Christ, they needed a place to grow. Does that make sense? They needed a garden to grow in. They needed fertile ground in which to, uh, to be planted so that they can be rooted and established in Christ. And the fact of the matter is that, uh, that growth best takes place together and not apart. And I began to look at Sunday school and hear what was going on in Sunday school. And please hear me, because I'm, I, I'm I went to Sunday school. I love going to Sunday school. Now, mom and them had, when I was little, when I was younger, I remember going to Sunday school. Uh, they had to drag me to what we call big church. This is big church. Because we're going to invite our elementary children to join us in worship as we uh, change our schedule. Isn't that neat? We want to, we want to do that. But, but anyway, I was squirming my seats and all that kind of thing. Uh, and Mother, I'm sure, had to take me out a few times. Uh, I, but, but anyway, I was learning how to, learning manners and how to be in church and all this But Sunday school was really important to me as a child. And as an adult, I realized that there was something about it, though, that wasn't quite meeting this need that I saw. Because Sunday school, if you're not careful, uh, sort of evolves into an information time. Of just sitting and somebody uh, reading a lesson and everybody saying amen and going home. And that's really what's not in mind when it comes to being rooted and established and growing and being in a pathway of growth. Really, it has to do with uh, not so much information as formation. Right? Being conformed into His image. 
And so formation has, there's a lot that goes on in formation. Not just information. Not just, just a Bible study. Please hear me on this. Because I'm encouraging you to, to be a part of a life group eventually. It's not just about a uh, knowledge of this. There is what we know in the church as the koinonia. The fellowship of the believers. And it's in the koinonia. It's in the fellowship of believers that this gets applied to our lives and understood better in our lives because we see people who are making application of it. We see people who are struggling uh, to, to make application of it. And it's in the dynamic relationship that happens in group or togetherness in the, in the koinonia that growth really happens. And I saw that. And so I would get with our Sunday school teachers and I would try to talk about these things. I'd say, don't just do a Sunday school lesson. It's not just about a Sunday school lesson. Make sure that you have time for, for fellowshipping. Make sure that you have an opportunity to, uh, to, to divide up and pray for one another. To spend time listening to each other and what's going on in your lives. Because, you know, we, some of this stuff, if you're not careful, you can get, you can get so heavenly with it that you're no earthly good. <laughs> to anybody. You know, you can sit in Sunday school with a, you know, a seven foot long, six foot high dispensational chart explaining the prophetic words. But if that has no effect on the life of a person in terms of being rooted and grounded in Christ and them coming to full maturity, then what good is it? It's just information. And I saw that. <coughs> and I think to myself, I wonder if maybe we could have a, a, a establish a church about discipleship and formation. And for good or bad, whether we succeed or didn't succeed, that was what was on my heart when I had an opportunity to, to plant a church. And it's in the DNA of who we are. And it's hard for me to believe that now, almost 10 years in, that the realization is something that probably should have been realized, you know, eight years ago is happening. I'm so excited about this. I'm so thankful. <coughs> I know that's where real life happens. In the corner. Yeah. God has called us to a life. And it's not easy. For many people, uh, it's a struggle. Listen, listen to what I, to, to, to this, because I, 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 I really mean that we have to have a heart and an understanding of this. There are people who live lives that are contrary to the gospel and contrary to the kingdom. And they come to Christ and they, and they don't want to be like that. But you have to understand they may not even know why they feel the way they do and why they do the things they do, why they've made the choices that they've made with their lives. I'm willing, I'm willing to concede that we may not understand all those shadow places that are a part of our lives. We know for a fact that that people are coming out of, say, an abusive relationship. They have a lot of shadows, and they don't, and they, and they live out of those places. They don't even know why. They don't know why they feel worthless. They just know that they do, and they live into that. They live into that worthlessness. We know that. They'll do destructive things with their lives. And they may not even know why. But I am suggesting to you that when they come to Christ, and when we come to know Him, we begin to, to conform ourselves. There has to be a place, a koinonia, a place for them to be able to talk about those issues in their lives, a place where those things get confronted by the word of truth, and light begins to get shined in the shadow places. Are you with me? And when the light begins to get shown in the in the shadow places, they they begin they begin to grow. They begin to see more clearly. 
And they begin to at least, at least, be able to make choices, even though their, their feelings may be different than their choice. They, 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 by their will, the act of their will and their choice begin to live into a Christ-like life. That's the hope. And the salvation is theirs. There are people who are who are hurting and they're wondering to themselves, why oh God, why am I going through this? And if they don't have a place to be, where there are people around them who are saying, you know what? You may just be being made ready for something great. Keep your faith. Hang in there. Keep going. Keep trusting. Keep loving. <coughs> and know that there is an inheritance that is yours, that is beyond imagination, and that God is going to make all things wrong, right? They need a place for someone. They can hear the word of truth that someone is speaking in their life. Pathway. Does that make sense? I wrote down. He calls us to be rooted and grounded in Christ and growing deeper in relationships through obedience to Him. Number one, ask yourself this question. Do I have a desire to grow? Do I have a desire to be a person that God can use? Is that who I am? And if you do, then commit yourself to the hard garden. Getting, picking the corn and cooking the corn and shelling the peas and eating the peas, you know, the eating the peas and eating the corn is the, is the fun part. But there is a whole lot, lot fun about some of the things that you have to do to get to the point of picking peas. <coughs> Standing out in the heat and toiling. <coughs> and pulling weeds. Mother used to tell me, she'd go to work, me and my brother, home during the summer. Y'all go out there and pick, a, uh, pick up weeds out of, the, out of the flower garden while I'm young today. Ugh. Ugh. Do I have to, Mother? You better have done when I get back. No. Not a lot of those days, but some of those days. When I got my own garden, I understood why she's asking me as a child to do that. I got my own garden. You don't get out there and tend to it. Believe you me, I know firsthand it grows up. You got to tend to it. And so am I willing to put in the, the time? Am I willing, willing to do the hard gardening? Am I willing to, in order for me to come to the full stature and knowledge of Christ in my life? Do I have a desire to grow? Am I at a place in my life where I'm willing to consecrate my Sundays? Oh, me. Where I'm willing to say, Lord, Sundays belong to you. Amen. Monday through Saturday, Mommy. I got a lot of personal stuff going on. Can you set us out of Saturday? Consecrated Sunday for worship. For growth. That's not easy all the time. Super Bowl today. <coughs> Are you caring for your soul in this way? Do I have a desire to grow? Miss Brown lived just up the road from us. Still to this day. Is Miss Brown still alive? I don't know. She is. She got me in her nineties. Little stone wall squares in her front yard. She had champion roses. You go by there at a certain time of the year. Most beautiful thing. See those roses blooming out there. It takes printing to have roses. Do I have a desire to grow? Second, do I have the discipline to grow? The hardest part of training is not the first day. It's the everyday. Right? I know that. The hardest part of training for anything, not the first day, but the everyday. And so I want to encourage you to develop a pattern for your life that leads to life. To decide to start the day consecrating your Sundays, consecrating your life, to giving room in your life for, for places like you to grow. 
to, to even make a commitment today to decide, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this life group thing. I want to be a part of that because I, I, I don't know if I'm going to get anything out of it, but I'm going to give myself to it. I, I just want to, you know, I just want to commit myself to it. I'm, I'm going to decide. I'm going to move from a desire to a discipline to make a decision and to dive into that life and have a determination to grow. They say that NASA, Jack, you make an answer this, I don't know. But they say that NASA on all the parts that they built from the space program, they, they put all those parts under stress conditions. And it's under those stress conditions that they get proven. And some of you know what it's like to be in stress conditions. Amen. But maybe, is it God's, is God up to something in your life? Is it the stress condition that you're under that's proven? And showing the goal in your life. It's rooted in, in grounding. So you need to have a place, a determination to grow in the midst of your troubles. To say, Lord, I am troubled, and that's why I'm going. Because I want to be with others. You know what you find out? You're going to find out what I found out about gardening. When you decided to be among others. And I was, I had a garden over at Center Springs, Alabama. And uh, I got it all, got it all like I like it. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm telling Mr. Sibley, who lived up the road from me, who was a cattle farmer and horse farmer, I'm telling him, I said, I, I got to get some fertilizer in my, in my garden. So I'm going to the co-op. He said, you'll need to go to the co-op. He said, I got some. I said, okay, well, I'll come pick it up. And he said, you ain't going to be picking this up. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'll bring it to you. So he comes down there in the front end loader full of barn veneer. Y'all know about barn veneer? Yeah. It smells really bad. <laughs> It's really got a lot of nutrients in it, apparently, because it smells really bad. And I bet you didn't get up this morning and then you would come to church and hear the pastor talk about barn manure and how good barn manure is, how important it is. He dumped that barn manure in my, in my garden and I tilled it in and it smelled and all that. But you know, good things grow out of crap sometimes. <laughs> huh? Is that okay for me to say? <laughs> Alright. I, I realize that's not a dignified thing to say. But I just want you to know, I know there's a lot of junk that goes on in our lives. And you, I, I, you need to know you're not the only person who's going through something. We all got that kind of thing going on in our lives. But, you know, is it possible that the combination of all the stuff that we go through somehow serves as the fertilizer for that koinonia and that somehow we draw strength from one another and it's out of the midst of that barn manure, out of the midst of all of that stuff that's going on in our lives that growth happens. The maturity happens. I began to trust in greater ways. Now I'm rooted and grounded. Maybe, maybe it's through all of that and my daily decision to follow Him, my daily determination to grow. And I become like a tree planted in the fertile ground and near the living waters. I want to encourage you. Moik, I'm talking to in the, in the leadership of this church. And my voice is no longer being heard, but other voices, when they're talking about pathways to grow in life, you hurt your ears up. You want to be a part of that. Let's stand together.